This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to this podcast, season six, episode twenty-eight. My name is Dimitra. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there, kids. And we're also joined by Homie Lopez Jr. in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? And Jonathan's a little under the weather. I feel like my hello there, kids, got, yeah, I got like really creepy there for a second with my deep, yeah, hello, sick kids. voice. Hello yes. there, children. Hello, step, have, have you ever been to see, Billy? <laughs> yeah. No. So Jonathan's got a bit of a, a bit of a throat issue going on today. So we'll see, we'll see how much um, chatting he's doing today. Anyway, so we have our fee, our keen check, our fact check uh, to start off with. Uh, we're talking, he was, we were talking about Sherlock Holmes last week and, uh, well, I was talking about British television in general, and he said that Sherlock Holmes it had four seasons with three episodes each. Yeah, they were two hours long, if I remember. Like, they were longer than double length of um, most shows. That was one of the exceptions. Between season three and season four, they aired The Abominable Bride, special episode on TV, and it was also in theaters. So each episode was uh, more or less 90 minutes, he says. Yeah, so I, I, th- I mean, like, you know, when I say an hour, I mean like 45 minutes because they you have to calculate time for commercials right and if you don't have commercials it it ends up being looking shorter but uh yeah because i think sherlock holmes is one of the exceptions to the six um episodes per season rule for british tv like for instance like luther the example i mentioned was was uh you know uh six one hour episodes i think oh no i have to fact check that now <laughs> All right, and I'm, I'll I'll just I'll read out this one here. We're kind of wondering, um, Mike McMahon, the showrunner for Lower Decks, uh, posted a, a couple things this week saying that this may in fact be, or he's trying to not have it be the last season of Lower Decks, uh, or season five, I believe it's going to be. Where, what are we in now? We're in four? We're in four, yeah. Currently four, and he's talking about uh, yeah. you're in production okay. for five. Yeah, and I think he in in the post he says things like, you know, it's a, it's a strange times and things are, you know, moving fast and everything's changing and so yeah, as as I think every every, you know, recovering from notwithstanding the strikes and things like that. Uh, actors are still on strike by the way as we record. Um but yeah, so concerns. Any thoughts on that, Jaime? I don't know what it means to have um sort of a full series run in the modern era. Um you know, if you go back to, uh, you know, the original series, it didn't have seven seasons. It was no, it famously cut yeah. off early. And then TNG sort of set the standard with that had seven, Deep Space Nine had seven, Voyager had seven. People look at Enterprise as being in, uh, ended early, and it was at, uh, was it four seasons, I think? Yep. Yeah, it wasn't very, very, very popular, yeah. So then you come back to this modern era where discovery is ending at five um, with Mm -hmm. the upcoming five uh, fifth season. And I think that's probably a, an okay number given where Mm -hmm. discovery itself happens to be. So if lower decks ended at five, it wouldn't be unprecedented in the modern era. So what I'm getting at is like, sure. Would I love to have it be a more TNG style for lower decks of seven seasons? If, If that's what they planned out, it's kind of a show that works pretty well for seven seasons, given it's an homage to that era. It would make sense. But I would also not be surprised if five was sort of the, yeah, this is where modern streaming says it ends and then something new takes its place. So I do agree with his point that, like, yes, you should absolutely be vocal with your fandom, watch the show when it comes out. Otherwise, you end up with the uh, very strange situation of prodigy of like, well, they made two, but they only aired one. and We have no clue when or where the second season is coming out. Mm hmm. And is it a full season? Do we know the season two? I believe so. I believe so. Oh, but it's not with your light of day. Yeah, yeah. Nobody really knows, right? It's kind of like stuck in limbo. The the funny part is there's going to end up being more episodes of shows like Enterprise just because they were doing twenty two per as opposed to twelve thirteen, right? So even though that's going to be considered a shorter run, only four seasons, it's going to end up with more episodes. Yeah, I'm with that. Keep an eye on that one. Well, speaking of Star Trek too, um, Todd Saj Sashwick, who plays Captain, what's his name again? Um, that guy, you know. Um, uh, was it Shaw? Shaw, Captain Shaw. Thank you. And he was also he was like one of the the bad bad guys in in um, the Twelve Monkeys as well. Um, he posted on Twitter that he had you know when he was I'll read what he says here. So when I was six, my first action figures were 
uh, Star Trek Captain Kirk, and 49 years later, he is now a star or an action figure and is a really cool um, site called XO-6 or XO-6, and uh, they, there's a whole series of um, characters. He, he posted a picture of, of, of his character, but like, you know, right now there's, they're taking pre-orders on Lieutenant Savick from Rafa Khan. They've got a, pre, a Picard pre-order. They've done, uh, they've got the, the um, Voyager crew coming out now too. So, and there's a lower deck set as well. So um, there's quite a few uh, characters that are doing, they're really like, you know, lifelike with, with actual clothes, clothes, clothing, clothes, you know, and pips and stuff like that. So pretty, uh, pretty cool collector series. Pretty well done. Like, I'm a little curious how they did these because, you know, for the modern cast, I t- think they tend to do a lot of 3D scanning, uh, not just for this sort of thing, but you can use the same thing to make these really highly textured models that look, you know, really on on key. But, like, there's no way Lieutenant Savick is going to have a 3D model, right? So uh, how much it looks like Kirstie Alley is, like, like it's really spot on, and I'm I'm impressed with that. But do you remember the Steve Jobs figures that some some company was going to make, and um, they I think Apple ended up, ended up quashing them, but mm-hmm. they, they had the very, in a very life cycle like looked just like him kind of thing, right? So yeah, but, um, yeah, it's getting it's getting way better than uh, the vague reference material you might have gotten if you were like me as a child and had the Star Trek: The Next Generation toys. Like I'm talking yeah. the first run toys. Uh, they were. A little, a little dodgy in the in the build quality. So I have a few of those original TNG figures right here on my desk. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, I mean, they were they were kind of. I think it was like you know, like I don't. I think it was like the sixty forty rule as opposed to the eighty twenty rule. They they kind of were just good enough, right? So it's not until we get into like series now where I think now that we've got you know high def and Blu Ray and all that kind of stuff, people expect a, a higher quality, right? So because even the even the stuff that comes out now on the Hasbro stuff is is quite good, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Whereas back in the day, I'm sure they probably just recycled characters and put different Stormtrooper outfits on them and stuff. Yeah, you, there's some really cool high-end action figures now. You can get the the super high-end ones that cost like a grand a piece, but they're amazing. They they look like they're like they look like they were captured the life-size person and miniaturized them. It's creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting to me. You see them at comic comic shops too all the time. Different characters and even even um, characters out of comic books and stuff like that. Kind of statues. Yep. Cool. All right. Uh, I mean, you got something here about Chuck? Yeah. So this is uh, a continuation of things. You know, traditions are very challenging when uh, when they have to change. And for a very long time, the Charlie Brown holiday movies have been uh, aired on on broadcast television. So it's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, and the Charlie Brown Christmas. Sort of the the crown jewel of that has been. Um, on Apple TV Plus since way back in 2020. And uh, this year, they'll be doing a very similar thing um, where those are on Apple TV Plus, but they are giving um, free service for a limited time uh, around each of those dates. So if you're in the Halloween mood for October 21st and 22nd, that will be available for free, uh, whether you're uh, a current Apple TV Plus subscriber or not. The Thanksgiving special is the 18th and 19th of November, and the Christmas special is the 16th and 17th of December. So um, I know some folks are kind of unhappy that it's not on their favorite broadcast channel. It is still free. Um, It is one of those things where technically this makes it available for longer than normal because it would normally be, you know, like 6 p.m. on a Saturday. And now you have two full days. So... And and people can get like they, they can get like this running without having to have an Apple TV account. Is that the? I think they're doing it like the um, the Friday night baseball that they did during the Major League Baseball season. Where oh, did they? Yeah, here's this free. here's this thing that you can watch for free regardless of whether or not you have an Apple TV Plus account. Clearly, in the spirit of, and then we want you to keep subscribing, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they've got some other specials here that I mentioned: the Velveteen Rabbit, Frog and the Toad, and the new Shape Island special. I'm sure those will be nice, but the, the the crown jewel here for people is continuing that tradition of uh, of Charlie Brown holiday specials. Which, um, as a quick callback to one of my choices many many moons ago now for um, the Strange Planet series on Apple TV Plus, I finally realized after seeing this, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's the vibe that reminds me of." 
Strange Planet is basically Charlie Brown in terms of vibe. Like you wouldn't binge watch Charlie Brown, right? Like that's bananas. But it's very comforting and and soothing. It's kind of low key, low paced. If you're into the Charlie Brown kind of vibe, you probably will watch Strange Planet for folks really? who are looking for yeah. a good analogy. That's why I feel like it it didn't do very well for me to watch like three episodes in a row when they uh, when they opened up the series. But watching you know twenty minutes once a week, perfect vibe, perfect vibe for that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't sat down and watched that. I keep seeing it come up as a, a trailer as, as I finish a series or whatever. Take one, like, you, know, you know, here and there, like a snack, like a peppermint, mm-hmm. instead of like binge eating peppermints. Yep. Yeah, cool. I, I definitely right, agree with you, Jaime. I think it's a good show, but it should not be watched in one go. No? No. Too intense? No, it's just, it's it's quirky, but it's... It, it's it's its own sense of sense of humor we i think we watched a couple in a row once and we we're like no no mm. yeah right it's 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 like an after dinner dinner mint you don't want to gorge yourself on them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right cool. all right and then this last story jonathan's posted here is uh a star wars star wars uh firefly costume designer has passed away uh shauna Trippick um did various um Costumes for Star Wars, and like I said, Star Wars, and um, you know, how, she doesn't look very old. Um, 56. Yeah, that's pretty young. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Sad to see somebody go. The The designs, the costume designs I've liked from things like Mandalorian, and I think Ahsoka's have been pretty pretty good. Give us something different for the Ahsoka character, Balin and, and Shin and stuff. Like, they're all something different than the traditional Jedi vibes. Yeah, interesting. It's sad, sad news. All right. On that sad note, we'll move on to the main event, which is Star Trek Lower Decks, Season 4, Episode 6, Hearth Ferengi's Heart Place. Okay. What are your elevator pitches? I'll go with mine, which is let's ship the Federation and the Ferengi and also ship Tandy and Rutherford. Mm, That's good. Uh, I went to the Ferengi Rules of Acquisition for my pitch. Uh, Ferengi Rule of Acquisition number 92, there are many paths to profit. Yeah, I was going to look for one of those uh, Rules of Acquisition myself, so um, cool. I didn't really have one, but yeah, it's it's typical. I've got to check out the fine prints, you know, So yeah. and the love, love of baseball. It, it, it was fun. We haven't really gotten much Ferengi outside of ds9 uh you know we got obviously like one episode in, in enterprise we haven't really gotten much otherwise from the ferengi uh in the last number of years so it was nice to like really get deep we got to see rom and lita again mm-hmm. it was it was fun to check in and 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 the ferengi greed jokes never get tired they and especially you know they were funny on ds9 but they're really funny when they just lean right into them on a show like this yeah yeah right and this Grand Nagus Rom, right? Yes. So that, those are arguably the the Easter egg hunts that I immediately noticed. The mm-hmm. you know Rom is still Grand Nagus and Lita is still around. So that's good. They've not been they've not been taken out by competitors, but it kind of makes sense given sort of Quark's um, sort of grand success that he's had post DS Nine era that we do see into Star Trek Picard that he's got like franchises everywhere sort of thing so uh, a little bit of nepotism doesn't hurt uh, in both the real world and in the ferengi world yeah yeah i mean if you i mean you can drill, drill into the the easter eggs or we can do best pew pew but yeah because i had i had grand negus rom right off the top as my my um, easter egg as well yep i'm guessing so you best. all picked up the uss tirana yes yes yeah which yeah. uh was that a parliament class ship as well like <laughs> Did not look back to see if it was like the Vancouver that we'd seen before. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I'm gonna call it it would make sense. I'm going to call it one, but then is there inevitably going to be a fact check that tells me that, no, it's actually something different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Keen does pay attention. Um, yeah. So uh, dumb cop, reasonable cop. I forgot what the reference to that is, but that was, what was that one? Oh, that I mean, was uh, the game they were playing, right? When when they were trying to uh, trick uh, the admiral, when Lita and Rom were trying to trick the admiral into opening up the negotiations to uh, include even more stuff, they were playing dumb cop, reasonable cop. Yeah, yeah, because um, Rom was pretending to like baseball and not understand contracts and stuff, but when in fact he was, he and Lita were manipulating the whole situation, right? So. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, it was fun hearing Max Grudenchik again being Rom as that sort of 
funny deep voice he's got and Rom. he's just so funny and <laughs> and you know having him just goof on baseball for 20 minutes while lita does all the talking is very funny yeah and then of course the the when the uh crew is sent down to review ferenginar um you know like a sort of a, a tour tourist what do you call it? tourist duty or something like that uh tour guide duty and um the uh Rutherford and Tendy get uh, cast as uh, as a honeymooning couple, and uh, which of course is you know plays along the whole will they won't they kind of you know um, vibe that we have with those two, right? Yeah. I thought for a minute there they would, but no, they they backed it off and tried to get out of it, but uh, they, then they found out what the co- what the consequence of getting out of it is, and you know, yeah. they survive. Yeah, well, that would uh, jump ahead to my big question. You know, are they really into each other, or are they just like the absolute best of friends? Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like um, it's it's like one of those things where in in the in cartoon world, comic world, right? You know, Bart Simpson never gets old, right? He never grows up, right? He never gets any older than he is. So, I mean, kind of, I think in those sense, that sense, they'd always just sort of be like they would be rendered as you know very into each other, but not not you know. I mean, I mean, the two of them strike me as not um, wise enough to know that they're into each other, right? You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. the The character designs did look like they were blushing uh, rather than sort of confused or weirdly embarrassed. So they're they're sort of teasing us, and they've been teasing us on this concept for you know pretty much most of the run. But we'll see what they end up doing, if anything, uh, around this particular theme because having them in the jeffries tube at the end like right on top of each other breathing right in each other's face uh is uh in a you know a, a non-romantic sense it just another tease back to like will they won't they that you mentioned yeah yeah i, th- I think you know yeah i think definitely we're supposed to we're supposed to realize that they're into each other but they don't realize it right? i think that that's the sort of the character of those two together right which is exactly why we need season five and six yeah, to find out what's going on with those two. Hmm. Well, five we might get, but yeah. Uh, no Easter eggs? I had a couple more Easter eggs, yeah. I, I saw in the credits, and I definitely picked it out when that opening scene. So we've been having these sort of guest appearances, and they're doing those opening scenes with the different races getting attacked by the mystery ship. And one of the voices jumped off the screen to me. It was Dave Foley, uh, Canada's own, of course. Dave Foley from uh, Kids in the Hall. And News Radio um, was one of the, the Ferengis on that ship that gets blown up at the beginning. That uh, that was a funny little cameo. Um, some of the stuff that was just up when they were, you know, in the background during the uh, the Ferenginar scenes. Uncle Quark's youth casino stuck stuck out as a very funny gag. Uh, I also like the recurring Sluggo Cola jokes, including you know, oh my gosh, they even put brand, they even put commercials in the in the actual episodes, and then they show the Paramount logo over top of uh, <laughs> over top of uh, Boimler. That was very funny. Yeah, it was. It was again. It was. It, it was the perfect place for a sense of humor show. Well, and then of course they're the they're in Loeb's Loeb's Lounge, you know, because the yeah. the Loeb's are the big. And I think at one point. Uh, when um, Mariner is is on her drinking binge with her friend, he, she's got like the foam Ferengi ears over her head with the with the bottles on either side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had the Genesis device or the mini version of the Genesis device. The, the very modern PC. version of it. It's, it's yeah. the uh, it's the new USB C version of the Genesis device, apparently. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And they had the they had the, they were working on the self sealing stem bolts at one point too, right? Which is the uh, Ember Nog and uh, what was uh, and Jake. Um, Jake were had this big scheme to get all these uh, self sealing stem bolts. So, yeah, so they were they were having trouble with the sealing part of the in the show, right? So I thought it was cool. Yep. And the rules of acquisition generally were all kinds of Easter eggs, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I was gonna say it def- definitely carried over into the quotes too. Mm-hmm. A couple of things uh, in terms of, I guess, an Easter egg that goes into one of my my big questions. Um, so Quark's Federation experience bar and grill is basically Star Trek, the experience uh, that used to the be in Las Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. yeah. And then at that, you could hear what appears to be in scene music. It's not, you know, music for us beyond the fourth wall. You could hear the the Star Trek, the motion picture and Star Trek, the next generation theme playing in the background. So is that mm. can now canonically that music exists in universe? Mm. That's a good pull. Yeah. That's a good pull. 
Yeah, I was like, it's playing so low that it's not playing for us. It's playing for them. It's background music, right? Well, did you know that the theme, like at the very end, the credit scene in the Star Trek motion picture, right, is the theme song from The Next Generation? Yeah, so being right. inclusive, I said you know, both of these, although for me, it's the TNG theme. Uh, yeah, and- yeah, no, that's what I mean. Like, I I was, like, I, I totally, I mean, I, what was it, 70-something, 77, 78, just came out after Star Wars, right? So, you know, and then we didn't, we tried not to watch it for, like, at least 10 years, and then, you know, the next generation came out, so they, they rolled out that same theme song. None of us, I don't think anybody else really, unless you were a super fan, uh, caught that, right? So, at the time. It sounded familiar, but not quite, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. So we got some quotes here. Do you want me to read them off? Yes, go for it. Starfleet's going to foot the bill for us to go to as many bars, restaurants, bars, hotels, pubs, bars, saloons, cantinas, and bars <laughs> and bars as, as we want. That's Mariner talking about the, the tourist, tour, tour, tour guide duty, I guess. Um, we'll also need someone to act as a couple. And since the Cerrito is statistically the horniest and least romantically committed crew in Starfleet, we have no married, no married officers on board. That's from Ransom. That's how he ends up getting uh, Tendi and Rutherford assigned to that role. Madam, please, I'm trying to enjoy a nice evening out with my biker gang, says the Ferengi biker. That, that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't kill me. Madam, please. please. <laughs> Madam, please. We're trying to get into this with... Um, yeah. Mar- uh, Mariner, Mariner and her friend, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, Dr. Miglimo says, uh, you don't have to throw it twice in my mouth. <laughs> Yeah, he's always about the regurgitated stuff, right? So, yep, the most disgusting and yet earnest person on the ship. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think overall this was a a nice, you know, just fun adventure. This wasn't, you know, there was no larger purpose other than to make us laugh, and it did. This was good. Mm-hmm. This is what I want from lower decks. Sometimes just to to sit and laugh at Star Trek at its funniest. What was the the, the remark about bringing Konos into the Federation? It was, was that was that one of the the um, demands that they wanted at the very end? Yeah, yes. you bring a planet. Oh yeah, so you know how many planets we have that are you know owe us something. We'll definitely bring them in. And it's like no, bring this specific planet. Yeah, uh, Kronos, yeah. the Klingon homeworld, into the Federation. Yeah, and the eight hours of Ferengi TV that Boiler ends up watching, right? So. Yeah, it was which, almost it's almost like that. Uh, was it was it Rick and Morty where they have the sort of weird television shows that they watch? Yes, the inter inter, inter interdimensional TV intergalactic. Yeah. I forget what they call it, but it is the the wild stuff that I think this should be some very short treks in the future. I would watch the uh, <laughs> landlord cops <laughs> trying to get you to sign a new <laughs> lease. <laughs> very freaky sort of thing. Uh, for me, I uh, I definitely laughed out loud several times in the Tendi Rutherford storyline where Parth is trying to get them to fully enjoy their their couple's uh, retreat. Um, the When he's taking photos of the couple and then they're like, oh yeah, let's just move on. He's like, no problem. We'll move on to the lingerie. <laughs> this, uh, this like conical bra, you know, Madonna type bra and this banana hammock. It just had me guffawing including when they're in the bar and grilled experience and it's like okay you've you you've eaten the 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 sexy chocolate statues of each other and proclaimed things you like about each other now it's time to consummate your marriage right here <laughs> in this box not where we can see you but where we can still hear you <laughs> just nuts yeah that was pretty funny yeah i like that the uh the Ferengi are happy to do this as long as you are honest. If you're making things up, then you have the high high crimes. You go down to the sulfur mines. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, they also had the the big sort of like memorial wall of people who have lost profit, which is very yeah. very Ferengi mm-hmm. for them. Which I guess gets semi religious for them, right? Because like you're supposed to see um, like the the person who weighs the scales and they don't weigh, you know, your good deeds and your ill deeds. They weigh your profits, uh, your credits versus your debits, the debits. Right. And you got to be at least vaguely profitable to make it into, uh, the, their, their afterlife. So that, that was definitely an interesting deep cut that they put in to show Ferengi culture. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Ahsoka. Star Wars Ahsoka part eight, the Jedi, the witch and the warlord. And, uh, you got elevator pitch, Jaime. 
Oh, mine for this one is arguably the elevator pitch for the entire series. I put uh, TSB, Thrawn Strikes Back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. same same place. I, I had just had the Empire Strikes Back. I was going to say the new Empire Strikes Back, but yeah, it's it's that's exactly right, right? Yeah, yeah. No, they were just they were, and, and it's almost like Gilligan's Island. They all get stuck at the end um, at the you know sort of the, the, the typical Star Wars ending where they kind of just stare off into the galaxy and try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, and I, mm-hmm. and I think it makes sense too. You know, I think we were a little concerned with how are they going to wrap up all the stuff that they had laid out we knew that it was going to carry over to the next sort of series or multiple series that they're going to do so in this case it makes perfect sense that they would they would continue this although this is the more definitive that there's going to be a second ahsoka series i think than we were before right i mean we didn't know that until this episode or the series yeah i mean they still haven't announced there's a second ahsoka series coming but i think Keep judging where this one ends up, it would make very little sense to have this continue in like Mandalorian next season or uh, what's what's the other one that's coming? Um, the one with uh, Jude Law with the kids stranded skeleton crew, skeleton crew like that doesn't make sense. Right. Although that maybe that's set in the galaxy further, further away, too. So who knows? So best pew pew for me. I had Sabrina, uh, Sabine yoloing the TIE Fighters. Oh, using the the wings of the ship to just crush the relatively uh, mm-hmm. fragile fighters, and and then her quote there of uh, "Got him." <laughs> I thought the uh, I had the Ahsoka versus uh, Morgan uh, lightsaber duel, lightsaber versus the sword of Talzin, as my pew pew because I think that's one of the better uh, lightsaber duels we've had in quite a while. You know, they they seemed equally matched. There was some pretty cool martial arts stuff mixed in, some wire work and stuff. I, I thought that was a pretty strong piece of of. It wasn't exactly Duel of the Fates, but it was pretty good. Yeah, I like I like the uh, the force jumping that they had to do to to catch up with the ship as it's it had already departed. Oh yeah, and uh, so I think uh, was it um one of the, I think uh, Ezra. Uh, so it's it's a, it's Sabine helping Ezra to to f- right. fly even further, right? Yeah, yeah, and then she was supposed to follow, but she, you end up, spoilers if you haven't seen it, but she ends up staying on the planet with Ahsoka and Shin, right? And Balin. And Balin. Yeah, well, yeah, and Balin's standing beside that big stone statue. What do you think that oh, video we'll, we'll, is? We'll definitely be getting to that in uh, in a moment. Okay, well, we can we can head to the Easter eggs now if you want, if you like. Sure. So I had three that were all pretty important. So the Blade of Talzin, the sword that... Morgan uses and is is gifted by the the great mothers. Talzin, of course, was the the leader of the Night Sisters on Dathomir from the Clone Wars, and uh, we we did actually we we have seen this sword before. She uses it at one point in uh, in in the Clone Wars episodes. So that was a pretty interesting uh, first time we've seen it, obviously in live action, and uh, it doesn't you know disappear or anything when she dies. So it still exists, which is interesting too. I, I wonder if there's more future with that because that's a pretty important and powerful relic um the other two are definitely huge things to build on so the statue we see at the end where we see balin standing on the arm of this statue outstretched and out in the distance we see him seeing this beacon in in the distance this the statue is of the father so uh if you search back in your memory banks to a three-part episode storyline from the Clone Wars, there's a really kind of unusual storyline that they did at one point where these three very powerful Force users living on this very isolated planet draw in Anakin to test him to see if he is truly the Chosen One. And they are known as the Father, the Son, and the Daughter, or some people refer to them as the Mortis Gods. And that statue we see in this episode is the Father. And the idea of them is that the sun represents the dark side, the daughter represents the light side, and the father represents the balance. He is what is in between the gray, which is where, where to a certain extent, Balin is, but certainly where Ahsoka is. So the fact that on this mysterious planet so far, far away, we are seeing this representation and that there's clearly something out there that is calling to Balin that is the reason why he's there and that we are staying on this planet with Ahsoka and Sabine and Shin and Balin uh, to explore, I think, more of that, what is 
you know, what is the force? What, what makes it up? Uh, sort of looking at that bigger storyline is definitely worth going back before they do any more uh, of this sort of storyline to, to refresh yourself with those three three episodes. Um, but I think if I, you know, we've been asking all along, well, what is it that Balin's there for? What is it Balin's there for? It seems like what he's getting to is is the root of, you know, what is the force and how can I, how can I, you know, either end this dark side, light side duality and, you know, get past that or is it you know in just to completely get rid of the force right so that's a pretty huge part of the storyline there there's a ton of articles that just start cropping up uh exploring you know the refreshing people's memories about what the mortis gods are what they did but I, again go back and watch those three episodes it'll definitely give you a lot more clarity although it is one of the most unusual clone wars arcs of them all it it, it uh, Ahsoka dies, literally dies at one point and has to be resurrected. Um, Anakin sees his future as Darth Vader and loses his mind. It's it's pretty intense and weird, but it's really good. And it, it does speak to a really epic, very connected to the whole Star Wars mythology uh, piece that this, is, this story is kind of building towards. And it also brings us to the other Easter egg I had here, which is Ahsoka's Morai. So the Morai is this bird, more or less, that uh, has, since she was resurrected on Mortis, uh, has sort of followed her and kept watch over her and, and shows up in places where she belongs. When she's on the right path, the, Mortis, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Morai shows up. And so to see her bird there at the end of this episode, when she looks off to the side and she sees the Morai, she knows she's where she belongs. And that's why she's so at peace with where she is. Right. So. All of this is tied into not just, obviously, the, the return of Thrawn and the sort of this rise of a new empire storyline, but it's really tied into the whole Force mythology and all the big picture stuff that Dave Filoni's kind of played with through Clone Wars and Rebels and, and shaping up to be a very, very ambitious and big storyline. Yeah, I think I think this obviously your, through your explanation kind of leads to um, leaving Hera and... Um... Ezra to deal with Thrawn while Ahsoka and, and um, Sabine and Shin and Balin kind of deal with what's going on over here on this world, right? Yeah, it is. And and it's tricky, too, because now we're also going to have Balin as the central character who's going down this path. And of course, Ray Stevenson, who did such a wonderful job as a performer in this series, is, has now died. So mm-hmm. they, I just don't see a way they can't recast him. It doesn't make sense, really, to do anything else at this point. They wouldn't have filmed stuff already. Like, I don't think they were doing any back-to-back season filming. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I don't think would so. need, Yeah, you would need like a lot of material to really, I think, bring a proper end to his character. I think the the only, I mean, unless they can do some AI trickery, I think the logical thing would be to just simply find someone who looks similar and and pay homage to the character as opposed to just trying to write around the fact that he's on this very important arc and is now just gone. It doesn't make any sense, really. So what do you think is next, I mean? Next for this series? That's a good question, because the 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 larger, just building off what Jonathan said, like the the larger from the, you know, more character-driven spiritual side is going to be the, uh, you know, on the dead planet with Ahsoka, Sabine, Jin, and, and Balin. Uh, the larger from a moving bigger plot stuff around is going to be, you know, Thrawn returning and Ezra returning and having to, to deal with the uh, revival such as it is of the empire. That's why, you know, calling this uh, Thrawn strikes back kind of works in the, like this series as a whole fits in as the, the empire strikes back of like the good guys don't win at the end. Right. And it's, it, it ends on a, a arguably a, a large cliffhanger of like what's going to happen next. Um, mm-hmm. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to, to see where they, they go with this and how they, they sort of tie things uh, in together to some of the broader pieces. Uh, Cause we know where stuff sort of eventually has to go, right? We know that the empire can't be fully revived because it at some point needs to evolve into its successor of the first order for the sequel trilogy. Um, and just like we were, you know, every time somebody comes up, we're like, do they end up learning, uh, you know, attending Luke's doomed school 
Uh, and he said, <laughs> okay, well, Grogu, no, he is off with Mando, totally fine. Okay, so we, we know he lives, but, like, what ends up happening to Ezra, what ends up happening to all these other folks, there's all of these bigger pieces that uh, there's still plenty of room to, to fill in some of these gaps. So uh, I, was, I was pretty pleased with this, this series overall of how it does things. I think it's honestly the better for not having tried to wrap it up in eight episodes. Like, I, I like yeah. that it is it is carrying forward. I think if they had tried to put a bow on it, it it was too ambitious. And, you know, we did criticize it a little bit in the early few episodes that it was a little slow and that it was a little bit uh, slow in developing the character. And then of course we had this great sort of arc over episodes four, five, and six that really brought Ahsoka and Sabine's characters into clarity. And then the last two episodes kind of tied up some stuff as far as, you know, Thrawn heading back, Ezra heading back and, you know, what happens with Morgan. So we got a little bit of closure, but the fact that it does leave it open-ended and set up this next phase of Star Wars TV and even a movie now, we know that they're going to do the Dave Filoni movie that comes out of this, I think is is exciting. I think this is some of the best Star Wars we've seen in a while. Like, you know, that you have more than enough reason to be dubious about, you know, a, a, what was a bit of a letdown for Mandalorian season three. I think this definitely helps reset the table a little bit better for a better future. Yeah, for sure. So I'll read the quotes off. Are you getting quotes before I read them off? I mean, uh, two more that I had. Um, I guess technically three. Uh, I like Hu Yang's. Uh, I have been teaching younglings to construct lightsabers for longer than you have been alive, um, which is not only a, a really nice one for him to tell Ezra as like, a, "Hey, you know, young buck, I've, I've I've seen a thing or two. But people online pointed out like. Hu Yang was saying this because he was telling Ezra, hey, the saber emitter is too narrow. And Ezra's like, no, it's fine. I totally like it this way. Which apparently addresses a meta thing that went on in Rebels came out of like people feeling the design of the lightsabers was just a little too skinny in that, uh, in that, uh, that show. Which I can see what they mean. It, it is a, for me, I viewed it as like a stylistic choice and less of a uh, in-universe change of any sort between fat sabers and skinny sabers. <laughs> so I, I like that one for that reason. And um, I, I liked the exchange between Thrawn and uh, more, um, Morgan, Morgana, um, for the Empire and for Dathomir. I thought it was really, really nice for those characters to give them a moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jonathan could, could hear... You, sir, have a method, not a system, or anything resembling a process. That I want on a t-shirt. Yeah. (laughs) I'll tell you a secret. Being a Jedi isn't about wielding a lightsaber. Train your mind, train your body, and trust in the Force. Ahsoka. That's Ahsoka to Sabine? Yep. Okay. And then uh, Thrawn, of course. Rain hellfire upon them. There will be no negotiating with the apprentice of Anakin Skywalker. So he's really got a a, a woody about Anakin Skywalker, too. Um, perhaps this is where the a Ronin such as you belongs. Today, victory is mine. Long live the Empire. And then uh, Ahsoka, Ahsoka at the end says uh, to Sabine, um, Ezra is where he needs to be, and so are we. As she notices her fl- her bird, as Jonathan had mentioned. I, I think uh, one thing I just wanted to flag, maybe just a quick note to Ezra, that if you're finally back after all this time and you land in an Imperial ship, Maybe, maybe step out with the helmet off. Just just putting that out there. Maybe step out with the helmet off as opposed to wearing the full uh, night trooper uniform when you step onto the to the flight deck of the rebel ship or the the new republic ship. Probably not the safest maneuver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he's lucky that uh, Chopper recognized him like a like a like a puppy. Oh, true. Yeah. Immediately knew it was him. And I like the, uh, he, when he assembled his own lightsaber, we didn't really talk about that earlier, how he goes at the beginning and assembles his own lightsaber so that he and Sabine each have their own now. And he, not only does he create a new one, but he uses a part that is the matching one to uh, Kanan. And then he also makes a blue lightsaber like Kanan's. So now he's sort of more the, the knight as opposed to the, the Padawan. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. From a, um, from an Easter egg hunt, uh, I think... The title is an homage to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, the, the pattern just fits too well. Uh, I was also thinking about some things like um, Kanan Jarrus as, as Caleb is arguably a, uh, an Easter egg here. 
uh, mm-hmm. not just mentioning him, but the fact that uh, his name is Caleb when Hu Yang knew him. And I really did find that Sabine's force moment, the first one, when she's getting choked out by one of the the, uh, the zombie troopers, is kind of similar to the out of necessity moment that Luke has when he's captured by the Wampa on Hoth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good pull. Yeah. Yeah, it's that you finally make that connection to the force when you need it the most. Yeah, you, you, you have no, no choice but to let go and just hope. And then it, it sort of clicks for you. Right. Well, we have one more show for you, folks, and that is Loki is back for season two, episode one. Uberos or Obi is, I think uh, Loki calls him. Um, do you have an elevator pitch here, I mean, <laughs> I, I was in a mood. Apparently, I wrote this. I said, uh, Loki keeps on slipping, slipping into the future <laughs> yeah, and the past. Yeah. Ooh, dial in a little Steve Miller band. Very nice. Mm. Yeah, I had, uh, it, it can be hard to hear the truth no matter when it happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was interesting, interesting show, like from the point of view of, uh, of uh, the, the bouncing around that he's doing. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that it, it really picks up right after we left, last, left this char- these characters, right? We kind of weren't sure if we were going to sort of, where we were going to jump back in, but it just picks up right when we left off. And I think we were meant to think that at the end, at the end of last season that Loki goes back to the TVA and time has been rewritten and they don't know who he, he is. So he's either gone back to the future or he's gone back to the present. But it then turns out in the very beginning of this, he's gone back to the past. That's why they don't know who he is, which seemed a little bit weird. I don't think that was clear what had happened at the end of last season. I don't know if that was like retcon or if that was just what they always intended to do, but it seemed a little weird. Right. Yeah, it did. It did sort of seem odd, and but then when he starts bouncing around forward, backward, and um, they can see it. But the other thing too is, I think I think we also had uh, Ant Man Quantumania in here, which gave a lot more um, exposure to um, what's the name of the bad dude? Kang. Oh, Kang, well, he yeah. who shall not be named. Yeah, that's what they call him in this thing. But um, the one yeah, who remains. The, the one who. Oh, remains, that's right. Yeah. He. Yeah, that's right. He's the one who remains. Yeah. And he's, he's actually hiding in this one, too, because when Loki uses the disruptor stick or whatever it's called to break the wall to show that he's behind his statue is behind the wall and glossed over, I guess. Right. Yeah. Cause did he go back to the past and he saw that the yep. the big bo- the war room that we're in had his his face there? Yeah. So I, I think he's discovering truths in the past and then he goes to the back to the the present or future and that's where he has to, to explain to people no you've been lied to no you've had your brains wiped no i've seen the past and this is not you know you're all be, you're all being duped right yeah i, I like the timey-wimey back and forth with ob you know like where he's like that's impossible you can't do that and then then you see loki flash to the back to the past and then tell him something in the past and then in the current time he's like wait a minute and then and all of a sudden the, the thought comes to him that what he resolved in the past, he's now remembered, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny how mm-hmm. he just kept, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there was like a, a four part conversation over two, t- two periods of time. It was very funny. Yeah. So what else would you have for pew pew? I, I put inside the loom, I thought was a really cool set yeah. piece. Yeah. It was really neat. Yeah. That's what I had where, where, uh, where Mobius goes inside and is trying to like pull him out and has the, I mean, it just has that wonderful neo future you know, special effects that they had from last season where it's kind of like 1970s sci-fi kind of feel to it with the big, huge hose attached to him at the back and stuff. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. special effects where they were pretty, pretty on point. And I thought that was, that was a really good scene. And then I, li- I like when he's getting all dressed up and he's like, is that a crack on the screen? He slaps the duct tape on, on the front of yeah. him. Yeah. 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 Don't worry. You're just going to lose your skin, right? <laughs> which which he does you know in the dust of the control room he does write in you know skin question mark which yeah, i thought yeah. was just a fun thing but it actually was a uh a way for loki to realize where he was mm-hmm. right he's like oh well i must be in the future here because i can see that skin has been written in this dust here right yeah not that there would be more dust on that or to cover it up over the time but oh well and from a, a set design standpoint, going into the loom, and I, I did pause the um, the the TV so I could get the exact quote on the floor leading into the loom right before it is danger. Temporal radiation levels escalate exponentially beyond this threshold. Likelihood of spaghettification increases seven thousand percent. Proceed with caution, which is a, a nice little 
thing because they did mention the uh, getting spaghettified. My life goal not to get spaghettified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have Easter eggs here? I, I only grabbed one. I, mean, I don't know if you have any. The, the floor wearing and the skin were, were my two Easter eggs that I wrote down. Yeah. The, the one that I caught was, uh, was from the, the mid credit scene that, uh, where we finally see more of, of, uh, Sylvie, right? She ends up showing up in 1982 in, in Brock, uh, Broxton, Oklahoma and walks into the McDonald's, right? And Broxton, Oklahoma is immediately a twinge for comic readers because there is a very notable arc of the, comics where after the destruction of Asgard in uh, Ragnarok, not exactly the same as the comic book, or as the, in the comic book as it is in the movie, but still same premise, basically, Asgard of old is destroyed. It is reborn uh, as a city floating about 15 feet above the surface of Brockton, Oklahoma. And that is where Asgard, the city, lives for a number of years in the Marvel comics. Whether or not that has anything to do with anything, or it was just a fun little Easter egg for the fans, I'll be curious to see how that plays out. But Broxton is a name known to, to comic book readers. Cool. Also, great deja vu reading those old McDonald's signs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the sort of iconography of McDonald's and its interior design of the, the era is like immediately something I picked up on. Yeah, I, I missed that scene. I actually, I did watch the credits, but I didn't. I wasn't paying attention. I guess. Yeah, it basically they go through the the whole sort of retro credits and stuff, and then they show that scene, and then they show the full credits at the end. Mm-hmm. It's it's not long. It's, not, it's maybe a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I may have seen it. I just didn't register. Anywho, um, cool. Uh, I did have a, a quote that I wanted to mention between sure, uh, yeah. Mobius and Loki, where Loki's describing. Uh, what happened with the uh, the one who remains and uh, having to fight Sylvie and uh, Moby's like, well, I'd ask who won, but <laughs> it was a draw. You you both kicked each other through time doors simultaneously, <laughs> just calling him out on his his uh, you know ego lie there of like, no, it wasn't a draw. You you lost. You got kicked out. Yeah, and Mobius, a couple of quotes here. John put down. You, it looks terrible. It's like you're being born and dying both at the same time. It's freaking me out. And then uh, a little while later, he says, uh, and when, when um, he's trying to explain, or Loki's trying to explain something to him, and he tells him his mind's been wiped. He says, I have no memory of my mind. My mind will be my memory wiped. And uh, Liv, what, what's the quality of life with no skin? He talks about losing the skin. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you have about an hour, boom, there. And you hear a boom, and then he goes, you have about five minutes. That's what Obi says. Um, Get ready to see some hoofing like you've never seen before, Mobius says. I guess that's when he's coming back to the... Yeah, that's when he's, he's talking to Obi to when he's just about to walk out the door to the uh, the loom, yeah. So my big question was, should this have been a two-part premiere? I know it's only six episodes for the entire uh, second season, but do you feel like we kind of got far enough here? Like, is there enough tease to make... I mean, obviously you're going to keep watching. We're going to keep watching. We always keep watching. But... Do you feel like there was enough hooking to to pull you in to want to see a second episode? Like, I feel like I didn't really get a real flavor of what they're relying on you liking the first season to want to watch episode two. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. exactly. Like, I think that that's the key here is I think if, if you came into the series with just this show, you you might be like, I mean, there's enough timey, timey-wimey stuff there, but you'd be like, why is Loki going through this? And, you know, they have the recap at the beginning to sort of catch you up if you if you trying to jump in on a, a show in the middle but i think i think more and more these these shows with long arcs you have to go back to the very beginning and start again right yeah i don't think this is it would be very successful just jumping in yeah i, th- I think it's uh more of a a recap and a reset sort of uh episode that i think you're right does heavily rely on you having enjoyed and watched the first season but it was like legion was like that too legion was very sort of you know in the second or third season whatever it was you had to know what, what went on in the first two to begin to really get a sense of where you were right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i do think the the sort of meta out of world uh, out of universe thing is that uh you know with the actor strike still ongoing and the writer strike having just ended i think we're going to see a lot of these shows try to stretch things out um i know that gen v for amazon uh, did actually drop three episodes which actually surprised me and kind of intimidated me so i've not watched that one. Um, 
surprised that they did that versus trying to tease it out and, and stretch it out a little bit longer with the episodes. But I did kind of wonder if, to Jonathan's point, if the reason they didn't do a two episode premiere here was because then you don't have as much content to back it up. Yeah, that that would make sense. Because I, I don't honestly beyond Loki, I don't know what's next for the, the Disney Plus machine. We we don't have any anything specifically slated other than we know November is going to have some Doctor Who, but we don't know when. But there's no more Marvel, there's no more Disney, there's no more nothing nothing on the plate. There's still an actor strike going on out there. So yeah, maybe this is just their way of saying, you know what? You're you're gonna get this over six weeks. We need six weeks worth of content and subscription right. dollars. Good point. Good point. Cool. Well, let's move on to the watch list if we're done with Loki. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got a couple of things here. Um, The pod generation, which I saw, I don't know how I ended up with this trailer, but um, stars, um, what's her name now? The uh, woman from, oh, Emily Clark. (laughs) Uh, It's a sci-fi movie about a couple who decide that they're going to have a baby. And uh, the way they do the babies in this, in this future, um, the the near future, not, not now, but um, is you, you, raise the baby in a pod and and you wear it on your you wear it like it's basically like a, a, a pregnant woman's belly but um you have a harness you wear it so the husband can wear it the, the wife can wear it and, you know madness ensues um sort of a sci-fi comedy i guess right so it looks interesting and then uh, argyle is one i stumbled across too which is uh an agent agent argyle it's sort of a um it's like a fictitious character agent argyle and it's you you see him in you know doing a, a dance almost out of pulp fiction with a with the femme fatale um but i think they're dancing to let's dance by david bowie and uh as you watch the trailer you realize that it's uh, it's actually not really a real situation it's actually and of course the the guy who played superman is plays agent argo um what's his name again henry cavill in- Henry Cavill, yeah, he plays he plays Agent Argo, and uh, it turns out to be a, a, a story actually written by um, Bryce Dallas Howard, and uh, she's talking to her mother, who's played by Catherine O'Hara, about this. This uh, she's a you know famous writer of this character Argyle, and uh, on in the trailer she um, comes across a um, a fan who turn and who she says, oh, and what do you do? And he says, I'm I'm actually I, I deal in espionage and. So he starts, you know, killing people and fighting them on the train, like you, like you sort of a born situation kind of thing, right? And uh, ends up taking her along with it. And the the premise of the show is that she's such a good writer that she's actually writing things that become true. So the the crime world is waiting for her to write her next chapter so they can figure out how this ends, <laughs> sort of thing. So it's sort of a play on, you know, the is this in her mind? You know, is this kind of like. Uh, We'll have to see how it goes. It's going to be on Apple TV. Um, it's got quite the cast, so uh, we'll, we'll have to see where it goes. What do you got, Jaime? I had a couple of, of picks here. From a nostalgia standpoint, um, the Beanie Bubble on Apple TV Plus about the Beanie Baby uh, craze in the uh, the 90s was, uh, was kind of fun. I think it's kind of... Str- how do I feel about this movie? Is it a movie or a show? It is a... Uh, it's a movie. Oh, okay. um, it is, I feel kind of flawed as a movie. Like I feel like a, you know, there's really nice production work. Um, I don't know that it's one I would highly recommend unless you sort of grew up or are very interested in the era, which is why I put you know, for the nostalgia as the sort of disclaimer, but the, the acting in it from like, uh, Oh my goodness. Um, Zach Galifianakis. Zach Galifianakis as, as the, one of the co-founders and Elizabeth Banks and, and several others. Like the actors really take the material and elevate it. So it's probably like a C or D movie that they elevate to like B level, if that mm-hmm. helps you. Um, so I, I thought that was one that might be worth watching. It was one that said, oh yeah, I remember Beanie Babies and just learning the weird sordid history of how that became a thing where you know couples divorcing um would like have the beanie babies laid out in a courtroom and then have to decide how they're you know equitably distributing these now essentially worthless uh, beanbag doll toys mm-hmm. it sounds a little bit like what they did with the the tetris movie right they it sort of went back and told the sort of weird story of of how tetris came to the market that was an apple TV mm-hmm. plus series as well or a movie as well right 
Yeah, yeah. And and BlackBerry to a a certain extent as well. Yeah. It's sort of these, you know, historical fiction or whatever. I think that's a good way of putting it because uh, there are definitely people who are like, well, this didn't actually happen. It's like, yeah, I mean, the... It's not meant to be a history class, right? So I think that, you know, fictionalizing some things. Uh, I listen to um, uh, Business Wars, a podcast where, you know, they will deal with historical things. And their disclaimer is like, hey, we try to base as much of this on the real world as possible. But we can't possibly know what happened on that phone call that we know happened because there's court records that, you know, so-and-so called so-and-so. So the dramatization makes it more entertaining. And I think it's the same thing here where I'm sure some people who, who lived through, you know, who are these, these characters are real people in, in real lives. They'll probably have quibbles with it, but it's not about learning the exact history. It's not a history class. It is entertaining ourselves with the dramatization of stuff that actually happened. So looking at it through that lens, I think is helpful. Yep. Yeah. My second one, because uh, tis the season as we are in the, uh, the spooky season of October, um, Chucky season three has premiered. And now, now that I've watched the first episode, I totally understand why um, I had uh, I had seen that Chucky promo that kind of looked like a like a press conference because the sort of pitch idea for this series or this season seems to be what if Chucky was in the White House? So that's there you go. weird. It, it, <laughs> it is very, very strange. And uh, I, I think they did a pretty good job for, for this sort of thing. I'm like, OK, I'm with you. I'll, I'll, I'll take the premise. Uh, I mean, I got to be honest, given what you folks have, have done the last number of years, I, I really don't see it as too far of a stretch, but it is a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I guess so maybe to be clear, uh, at least in this first episode, Chucky is not president, but he is in the White House. So causing his chaos there. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Sure. I feel like inevitably, I I have no spoilers for the the season, but I feel like inevitably uh, Chucky will somehow be very close to launching the nukes or something. (laughs) So I'm going to keep that on the on the uh, on the wall and and then check that box if I'm correct in my my prediction. I mean, really, if you're going to do this, why not do that? Right. Why wouldn't you? You'd have to. It's like a necessity. Yeah, it really does. It really does. All right, typing. All right, my uh, my pick this week was something Jaime I mentioned earlier, which was the uh, the boys spinoff Gen V. Uh, they've dropped the first three episodes all at once, and then new episodes are dropping on Thursdays. So I have now seen half of the episodes, one through four out of eight. Um, if you're a fan of the boys, I think you will probably like this very much. It it is a really clean extension of that world. The idea is that this is set inside the university where the kids who have been injected with compound V go to learn how to do the different things that they do in their, in their, the boys universe. So some of them will go on to be crime fighters. Some of them go on to be reality TV stars uh, and Godolkin university or God, you is where they go and, and learn. And this season is set around sort of this big mystery of you know what lurks beneath the school which of course is a great trope we've seen that in Buffy and and lots of other series over the years but uh but it definitely fits in it's very much the same sense of humor it's over the top it's gross it's sexual it if you are a fan of those things you will probably enjoy this very much um it's a pretty easy watch it's not uh it's not necessarily a cerebral show i will say it's 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 you know it's pretty easy to just sort of sit and watch people you know make dirty jokes and drug references and and blow each other up and stuff like that but i i enjoyed the first four episodes i'm definitely in for the rest and uh especially in the absence of of the real boys series which i think has a little bit more to say about this world um i think it's yeah it's really good really enjoyable I think we talked about them before this show before, right? I think we talked that it was coming, but uh, it just dropped last yeah. week. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's it for another week. So, hey, hey, Jonathan, people want to get in touch with you. Where would they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter or X and Instagram as at JPK News or on YouTube at YouTube.com slash at JPK. And you, honey? I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. 
All right. My name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A on the Twitter machine is where you find me. And so until next week, we'll see you in the future. Or next time, I should guess I should have said. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. I'm getting into my spooky Halloween season voice now. <sighs> yep. Ugh. I went through an entire pack of hauls and a large glass of water and a full box of Kleenexes to get through this. Yeah. I, I'm always taking Ricola during the show because my, my throat gets all clamped. Yeah. I, I'm so happy that my daughter's back in school, but oh my God, whatever she brought home is going to be the death of me. Where is she at? High school? Yes. Yeah. She went back, uh, started back in high school. Uh, mm. Oh, a week week and a half ago so very happy for that but also ugh, gross tis the season yeah yeah all right well i'm gonna sign off because uh i don't have i don't have much left so all right uh, all right we'll reconnect next week and we'll figure out what we're gonna do yeah all right talk to you later all right. later take care guys. bye bye, bye.